thanks for joining us. Uh, this is Lesson 6 of the course, uh, Common Biblical Emotions. And what we're doing is we're looking over the different characters of the Bible and the circumstances that they find themselves in. And we're trying to see if we can figure out some of the emotions they may have been experiencing at that particular time. Now, as stated before, we're also trying to see how we would react in the same situations. You see, it's easy to judge others on how they react in circumstances, but when we're faced with the same circumstance, we see that we may not have handled it as well as they did. Uh, they always tell you, uh, always walk a mile in uh, the person's shoes before you make judgment on that. Uh, so we really need to be careful and try to live by that. We don't know what we would do when we're faced with certain things. We have a good idea. A lot of people think they know what they would do when they win the lottery. But uh, once they win it, they find out that they sometimes go exactly opposite of what they said when they find the stress and stuff. And if we haven't gone through what these people have gone through, then we don't know exactly what kind of thoughts that they have going through their mind. Plus, each person's different on how they handle their emotions, and each circumstance is different. Different lifestyles and different things that may have happened uh, in their lives up to this point. Maybe even the people that's involved with the situation is different than what would have been with the people that's involved in something that's similar that you may have gone through. So it's very, we need to be very careful how we judge others of what they do. But we, at the same time as we're doing this study, I want you to try to think of what you might do under these certain circumstances. And the Word of God warns us also about judging others. He said, unless we fall into the same temptation... And the Bible says, and be overcome. In other words, we may feel like that we're all all that and won't, uh, won't fall to that and maybe that particular thing we want. But if we find ourselves in something similar or something that can be compared to that, we might just fall as well as they did. So we need to make sure that we don't judge because the Bible says he'll judge us the same way. Uh, so before we go any further, let's go ahead and i like to open up in a word of prayer. So let's have a word of prayer before we go any further. Father, thank you once again for this opportunity to be able to teach this class. I thank you for each student that's a part of this and want to learn more about emotions. And God, I pray that you will give us what we need at this hour. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your glory. And for what all you do for us, we just ask that you will help us uh, to be better people and learn from this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last week we were uh, getting towards the end of Lot. We had talked about Lot. We had talked about uh, some of his emotions. So we want to finish up with that. And then I believe what we'll do is I believe we'll go ahead and move on to Job. Um, now when we get into Job, I want to take a little bit more time with Job because uh, in that particular book, there's several chapters just over one person's life. As a matter of fact, as far as I know, it's the only book that is, that's dealing with one person's life and the circumstances that he found himself in uh, from start to finish. So uh, I, I'm sure that God really wants us to glean from that. And at that, for that reason, we'll try to spend a little bit more time with uh, Job than we have with the rest of the characters. Uh, so we'll go ahead and right now, though, we'll pick up where we left off. Now, when we left off, uh, we were at the place where the angels had come to the city of Sodom to destroy it. And of course, we know that Lot was there in that city. And up to this point, the men of the city were, remember, were trying to get at the angels. And to keep that from happening, Lot had even offered his own daughters to them. Uh, we, I think we've also, we've, we've also discussed his emotions that he must have had in making that kind of decision. Now, we know... Uh, that, that he cared for him. It's not that he didn't care for his daughters. But I believe he understood the seriousness that was involved when it's dealing with godly things. I think as Christians today, we don't understand the seriousness. We wasn't around at the time of the law. We don't understand what all God commanded at that particular time dealing with his children. They had seen God work miraculously. They had seen God judge people that was against the law. So I'm sure Lot knew these things, and, and he was frightened for his own life and for the life of his family, but at the same time, he understood that he must serve God. The Bible tells us that we ought to serve God rather than man. No matter what man says, God's word should always trump whatever man is saying. 
So here, although he must have had tremendous amount of love for his daughters, he still offered them up to these uh, the, these men of the city to try to keep them from harming the angels or getting at the angels or men of God. Uh, so that's admirable of him. And I, like I said, we I think we discussed all those emotions, so we won't go much more back into that. Uh, but we also discussed how the angels hit the men of the city with blindness. And yet they continue to try to get at them, uh, which still amazes me when I think about that. But there again, uh, when we commit sins that we know we're not supposed to, and uh, we continue to pick that sin back up, knowing that God can send judgment, and sometimes he even does send judgment, a lot of times that sin has such a grip on us that we will continue to do it even though we have suffered some of the judgment of God or some of the punishment from God. And that's where these men in the city are. Now, they're totally deprived. It's not just that, there's, as we said last week, it's not just that they were trying to do these homosexual things. They were evil and continually evil. The Bible said they would not repent. So we'll pick up at that point. And I'm not sure a lot was surprised to hear that the men had come to destroy the city. That alone, I'm sure, brought a, a sense of fear and shock and dismay and surprise uh, when he found out that the men had come to his place that he'd been living and we're going to destroy it. Now, evidently, I know that Lot said he was vexed with what was going on, but he must have gotten a little bit comfortable there because he continued to stay there. Have you ever lived into a place that you knew that uh, was not a good place to, to be, but yet you didn't move out? I, uh, matter of fact, I, I've got people that I know of that lives in areas that, to me, are very dangerous. But when they first moved there, uh, they didn't. it wasn't a dangerous place. And as time went on, it went on so slowly and progressively got worse that they don't even realize they're in a dangerous place anymore. They don't mind going to the stores, although there's uh, murders and shoplifting and, and robberies that goes on during that time. And maybe this is where Lot has found himself. He had gotten maybe a little complacent of what was going on, although he could still see the evil. Today, we're still kind of in that situation because we see the, the evil all around us, but yet we still love America. America is still one of the best places in the world that you can live. We're the freest nation that I know of, and we're able to do a lot of things. Now, that's changing quickly, and it, it, to me, it might not be but just a few years. We'll see that completely change to where we won't have that freedom. So we need to make every opportunity that we have to use the church and witness as we can, read our Bibles, be ready for that. But here Lot is. He's still in this city, even though it's wicked. And he's got two daughters. Now, the men of the city obviously didn't want the girls. So I'm sure that, again, probably brought some sort of uh, emotions in Lot. Was he worried that they would never find a husband because they weren't looking for women? Uh, did he think that he had ever have the, the grandkid? Now, we found out later that, sure enough, they did have husbands uh, because they wouldn't go. So we know that they eventually did, but before that time, him living there, knowing the wickedness of that city, it appears that more of them were more uh, on the homosexual side than they was on the other. Or maybe they had gotten to the point to where they were both uh, attracted to male and female. But here they just wanted the males. So maybe he had some emotion before that time. I'm sure he was relieved when his, uh, his daughters finally found them a husband. And I'm sure he was thinking, well, now my life's set. I'm going to have grandkids and life's going to be good. We're in a bad place. And, and imagine that, too. He, he was going to be bringing his grandchildren up into a place like this. It's bad enough when our children go through it. But as we talked about before, as grandparents, we usually have a greater love for our grandkids, it seemed like, than we did for our own kids. Maybe because the stress of life's not as bad. Maybe because we've already obtained uh, some of our worldly goods to where we're not stressing so much. But whatever the reason, we have a very fondness towards our grandkids, and we don't want anything to happen to them. So the fact that his grandkids would be living in there, you would think that Lot would have wanted to pick up his belongings and go. But like we discussed too, some people believe that because of him talking about sitting at the seat in the front of the, of the city, that he had some sort of position there. Maybe he thought that by having a position there that he could bring change. Uh, we had discussed before how some people believe that they can marry or, or date somebody who is lost and not serving the Lord, and they themselves are Christians, and they think they can change that individual. But we see time and time again that normally doesn't happen. What normally takes place is that the evil would be transferred over to the one that's good. <laughs> And they will quit doing so much. I don't know why I got the hiccups. Please bear with me. 
Um, but anyhow, there is at those particular times that maybe that that's where Lot had found himself, that he may have thought that by him being in some sort of position that he could change the city and win them over to the Lord. But it doesn't appear like much ground had been taken place on that, and we don't know why. The Bible's not very plain on what's going on there. But the very place that Lot and his family lived and had established a life, uh, that's where the angel said they're going to come and destroy. And there again, we talked about how it must feel to have to move from one place to another. And out of fear from hearing this, he immediately tried to rescue all of his family, including his sons-in-laws. That's how we know that his daughters did find husbands eventually. But the son-in-law, the Bible said, laughed at him. Now, that's an emotion. They laughed. Now, why would anybody laugh at someone when they're saying, look, there's two men in the city, and they've come from God, and they're warning us that God is going to destroy this city, and we need to get out. Well, when we look at it in today's society, we're telling people that Christ is coming that uh, sin in this world has uh, gotten so bad that he's fixing to end it, and he's coming. And people laugh at us. They, they mock at us. They say we must be stupid in what we believe, and they don't believe in a God. And maybe that's where these guys were. Um, maybe they didn't serve the God that Lot served. But there again, you, it makes you wonder if, if maybe Lot wasn't living the best life, although he was vexed to see sin. Maybe he wasn't living the Christian life in front of them, that they thought he ought to live. And because of that, maybe they mocked him. We don't know. Like I said, the Bible really doesn't go into that. But like I said, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get into their shoes and see what's going on. So what do you think? What do you think them, them son-in-laws would laugh when he told them that? Do you think it might have been because of the fact that they didn't believe in God and didn't believe in his judgment or believe anything was going to happen? Or do you think that maybe it was because of the fact that Lot's lifestyle uh, may have made a difference. Maybe they were thinking, well, Lot, if you're if you're so concerned, why did you not move earlier? Why did you allow all this go? Why are you in a position of authority? If he was um, in a position of authority here, if you if you feel like this city's evil, why would you allow your daughters to be there? So I'm sure there was a lot of questions they were having, maybe some confusion they was having. Uh, but one thing uh, it does show laughter, but we'll find out later that laughter is going to turn into sadness. But you can also see some anguish and dread from Lot also uh, when the angels told him to get out of the city. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 16, it says, And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. Now, did, did you catch something there? Did you understand what that verse had said? It appears that Lot did not really want to leave, although the Bible said that he was vexed every day because of the sin that was in Sodom and Gomorrah. The reason we know that is because the Bible said that Lot lingered. If Lot knew that God was sending the, uh, the judgment, if God knew that it was important to get his family out and was concerned about his daughters, loved his wife, loved his kids, uh, then why did he not immediately get up and leave? Could it be because of the fact that he had concern for the people there that was lost and was going to be destroyed? Maybe his friends uh, he was thinking about. Maybe it was the son-in-laws he was thinking about. Maybe that was the reason why he lingered. But it could also be the fact that he was thinking about all the possessions and stuff that he had while he was there. And that he didn't, he didn't want to leave that. Maybe the, maybe the position that he held, he didn't want to leave. Uh, sometimes we get into such places of authority, and even though we know we shouldn't be there because of the clout and because of the uh, benefits from it, we don't want to get out of that situation, and maybe that's where Lot found himself. But you can see that he was kind of grieved, and uh, he was kind of sad, evidently, that he was leaving for some reason or another, and therefore the Bible said he lingered, and that the angels literally had to get a hold of him and obviously his wife and daughters too, none of them seem like, of course, we can kind of understand maybe why the daughters didn't want to leave. Uh, the daughters probably didn't want to leave because there's their husband. We've kind of talked about that already. Uh, they didn't want to leave their husbands. They didn't want to leave what, uh, what kind of possessions and stuff they had. And none of them, I'm sure, wanted to leave their positions, but possessions. But the Bible says that if we're not willing to leave father, mother, sister, and brother uh, for his sake, then we're not worthy of him. 
And uh, he also tells us we're not supposed to lay up the treasures here on earth, but that we're to lay them up in heaven. Uh, and often we, we get so much here in America, we're blessed to where uh, we feel like it's all ours and we don't want to leave it. I've heard younger people, and I've said it myself when I was younger, when they talk about the rapture, I think, well, I really don't want to go. I mean, I haven't, I haven't got married yet. I've not experienced this. I haven't experienced that. I hope you don't come today. But when we really get on serving the Lord and understand the benefits that come from that and understand uh, what all he's got prepared for us, it should be an excitement knowing that this time is just about to end. Now, just like with what maybe Lot was feeling, I'm sure there's times in our life, though, that, that, that we don't want to see the Lord come because we have loved ones and friends that are not ready. Uh, so uh, I can kind of understand where a lot might have been coming from if that's what he was feeling, maybe his wife was feeling, and even what his daughters was feeling. But like I said, the Bible said that, that that Lot lingered, and the Bible also said that the angels had to literally take him, his wife, and his daughters by the hand to get them out. And like I said, maybe his leg might have been because he was still wanting his son-in-laws uh, to make it out alive. But I'm sure his heart was full of sadness and anxiety because they would not listen. And uh, we'd already discussed that some of the emotions uh, where his daughter, knowing that they'd be giving up the, not only their husbands, uh, but also the ones that had been in charge of protecting them and also giving them inheritance. And maybe he knew much uh, daughters loved their husband too. Maybe that was part of Lot as a motion because he knew that the daughters loved their husband and he knew that they would suffer with a broken heart and fear of what would become of them. Uh, Any time that uh, we have our children go through a, a relationship breakdown or, or they lose a loved one or something, it, it affects us as well as it does them. Matter of fact, sometimes it could even affect us even more so because we have that love for them and we don't want to see anything bad happen to them. So a lot of times that affects us. And maybe this is where Lot was as well. And maybe he was uh, heartbroken knowing what his daughters might have to be going through uh, because of the fact they're leaving their husband. And maybe his emotions were because it didn't mean no more grandchildren for himself until they could find another husband. Uh, the story doesn't go on and talk uh, about anything else, so we don't know whether they remarried. We don't know much about whether they had children or not, uh, whether he'd have an inheritance for himself as far as in this particular setting, we don't know. And so maybe that was some of the things that he was grieving about. Uh, it would be a sad thing to know that you're the last of your of your particular heritage. I know some people that they have no more brothers and sisters or kids or cousins or anything to carry their family on. So when they're gone, uh, their life's legacy, their family's uh, legacy is gone. Uh, the history of them's there, but it's not going to continue. Uh, so that would bring a lot of stress and a lot of uh, all kinds of emotions of discouragement knowing that this is it. Uh, there's no more hope after that. And he could have had a sense of hope that if he lingered, Maybe the husband would change their mind. Maybe that's why he was lingering. Uh, but like I, uh, like I said, as we know, the angels told Lot and his family not to even look back at the city. Um, so even with all these emotions that he had, and knowing his son-in-laws were there, the husbands of his, of his daughters, knowing that his friends were there, and, and could have had some family members there, we're not sure. But knowing all that, um, I'm sure he's grieved and, and he wants to stay. And it shows in some sense of the way that he wants to stay by him lingering. But yet they said, don't even look back. Now, there's an interpretation that some people believe that looking back means going back, to walk back after he carries them out. And some people believe that when uh, his wife was turned into a pillar of salt, it wasn't because she just turned her head back, but that she actually started walking back to the city. Now, there's no proof of that. Uh, that's just some of the ways that they've interpreted the wording of that and saying that the translation could be brought up that way. But either way, the angels told them not to look back. So whether it be looking back at the city or whether it be walking back, we don't know. But I'm sure that Lot understood the directions that the angels give and his wife. I'm sure they were very clear on whatever that meant, whether just to look back or to walk back. They knew not to do it. Because of all the emotions and the memories that Lot had built up in that city, I'm sure, though, it was hard not to do so. Can you imagine? I mean, let's say he had built a home by himself. 
and his family uh, lived in that house. And that's where uh, his daughters were born. That's where uh, maybe they even all lived in the same house uh, sometime. And so there was memories cherished there. Year after year, uh, uh, they spent time together and, and made memories. And yet he can't look back at that house. He can't look back at the place that had been a part of him for so long. And obviously he had been there for a while to have children. But yet, thanks be to God that he obeyed what God said. But like I said, I want you now to just take a few moments and I want you to name some of the most emotions, such as family members and get togethers and stuff. And I want you to think of those in a term to where you've got all these memories. Let's say, let's say it was a family home, maybe your mother and father's home uh, where you grew up as a kid and you had your birthday party there and, and, and you watched, uh, you watched all kinds of things taste like there. Maybe you had favorite pets, maybe you had favorite friends that you played with and you decided you're going to go back to the old home place. And so you drive there after you've been gone for years and years and you drive into the neighborhood. You can't even recognize it anymore. Maybe they come in and a construction company has mowed everything down and built big skyscrapers to take its place. So I want you to take a few minutes. Uh, uh, of course, you can do this later on as, as, after the class is over, but I want you to take a few minutes uh, this week and I want you to think about that. Uh, how would your emotions be knowing that that was the place that you were brought up in. That was the place your mother and, uh, your mother and father started. Uh, that's where your whole family heritage started taking place. And now there's no way to go back to see it. There's no one around that you knew. Uh, it's just over. It's all just part of memory. How would your emotions be? Would you be sad? Uh, some people might be glad. Some people didn't have a good home life. And maybe they're glad that the house is gone. How would you think about that? Well, regardless of how... Uh, you might think, or they might think, or Lot may have thought, or his, his daughters may have thought. His wife, however, uh, she did look back, and she was turned to a pillar of salt, as we see in the story. So obviously, she had strong emotions tied to that city, and we don't know what she was looking back for. Uh, maybe she was just glancing to see if the son-in-laws were on their way. Uh, her being a mother-in-law and the jokes about mother-in-laws, that kind of doubtful. But we don't know. Maybe she did love her son-in-laws. and Maybe she was hoping that they would come. Uh, but maybe it was also because of the fact that she, she had pleasure being there. She had com comfort being there. That was where she felt safe. That was where uh, she had been protected all these years. This is where her kids were born. And, and they had a lot of sentimental meaning. meaning. So uh, regardless of what God said, she decides she wanted to look back. Emotions can make you do things that you don't want to do. Uh, let me, let me give you a, a, a for instance. There's a pastor friend of mine who has a son, and he had a daughter. As a matter of fact, he had more than, than just the one son and daughter, but this particular son and daughter, the daughter was dating this man who was giving her drugs, and the man was a drug dealer. And eventually, the drug dealer found someone else that he wanted to be with. And so what happened was is he caused uh, this boy's uh, sister to overdose on drugs thinking it would kill her. Well, it didn't. It left her paralyzed and, and sort of an invalid. And so the son, out of his emotions, because of what happened, decided he would take vengeance in his own hand. So he decided to go over there to the drug dealer, and when he did, he opened up the door, and he found the drug dealer was in the house with another woman, which infuriated him. I mean, they were making out, so obviously they were, they were a couple, and it infuriated him knowing that his... His sister could have been dead, but now she's just an invalid. And yet here he is going on with his life. So out of his emotions, he turned around and he killed both the drug dealer and his girlfriend. Uh, it's not good to go on your emotions. You need to stop and think before you do anything when you're having emotions of anger or you're having emotions of, of being upset and severely saddened over a situation and want to change that situation. And so... Uh, Emotions can cause us harm if you're not careful. Well, this particular emotion caused Lot's wife harm. She had some sort of emotion, some tiredness uh, to that city, and she had a longing to go back there, uh, even though God was trying to spare her life. And so God did exactly what he said. He turned her into a pillar of salt. Now, that, after that happening, I want you to think of this. Can you imagine being Lot and his kids when they seen 
that happened right before their eyes. <laughs> I mean, here you are walking along. Uh, you're getting out of the city. Here's God's men helping you get out. And there's lots of uh, um, emotion there. You're, you're fearful. You have a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of questions that you have, uh, a lot of concern that you have, a lot of regrets that you have. Tons of emotions going on at that particular time. And you're, you're wanting to go quickly because you don't want any of this to fall on you. And the next thing you know, your mom turns into a pillar of salt. Now, there's no other place in the Bible that's ever been recorded before then. There's no other place to where that's been recorded after then. And I believe the Bible to be literal when it said she turned into a pillar of salt. Matter of fact, the Bible said that he poured down hell and brimstone. And many of the theologians talk about uh, salt was mixed in that, and that's how she was covered with that salt. Uh, that was part of that judgment. And a matter of fact, when they started excavating Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about, they found a high concentration of salt in that area. So I believe that God did what he, exactly what he said he was going to do. He turned her into a pillar of salt. But like I said, imagine you're walking along, you're trying to get out of that city, and there is your mother, and all of a sudden, poof, she turns into a pillar of salt. Or maybe it was your wife, and phew, she turns into a pillar of salt. Now, before you even think it, I know how most men are thinking. Uh, some of you might say, well, with my wife as mean as she is, I'd be uh, ex excited. I'd be glad. I'd be relieved. Uh, but I'm sure Lot didn't feel that. I'm sure uh, Lot was, first of all, shocked, and his kids. Uh, fear, I'm sure, was one of those emotions. Uh, stress was one of those emotions, I'm sure. Um, uh, maybe a lack of understanding, a confusion uh, was some of the emotions. Maybe uh, even some anger because that took place because after all they were at least out of the city and they had done what they said except for the part of looking back. Maybe there was some anger there thinking, well, couldn't you give her a break? I mean, my goodness, she's an emotional creature. And if people always blame God for their sins. And women, uh, the Bible says, uh, or, or science says that we are an they are an emotional being. They, they think with emotions, and we see that. Uh, that's why they, a lot of them are not good for leaders as far as leaders of country, because a lot of them, because emotions, don't want to go in war, and sometimes war is a necessary thing, so you have to be a little harsher on things like that. But uh, God doesn't cause things like that. The homosexuals are trying to blame God and say, it's because of God the reason I'm a homosexual. God doesn't cause all that. We all have a choice. We all have desires. We all have longing. We all have want. But it's because of the fact that sin had entered into our bodies. And sin is enmity with God. So anything that's godly and holy, our body doesn't like. It's not that God did that. We did that on our own when we decided to sin against God. And so maybe there was some anger there and some unjust anger towards God, thinking that God created her to be that type of individual, and now she's being destroyed. And like I said, our world today with genders and homosexual and different things like that, they're trying to pass it on God. Why is God going to judge me? Why is God uh, mad at me because of this? He, after all, he's the one that created it. No, he may have created emotions in us, but he didn't create us that longing to rebel and to do evil things. That came from the fall of man. And so that's what happened with Lot, and, and I want you to, like I said, I want you to think about that, and, and also it also concludes uh, what we was talking about with Abraham and Sarah and all the things that took place with them. And as I said, I repeat it quite often. We have not gone over all the emotions, I'm sure. So once again, what I want you to do, and, and, and this is, needs to be your weekly assignment. There's not going to be anything written on that. We'll have a written assignment in midweek. Uh, but for right now, this is your assignment each week as we go through these lessons. I want you to take out that time. I want you to take time and meditate. We can read the Bible, but if you don't take time to meditate, we don't get as much out of it. And it's going to be the same way with this course. We're talking about emotions. We're trying to see the emotions of these different people. It's in the Bible. So I really want you to take out time, and I want you to think, and maybe even write down uh, different situations that you come across as you're reading that story again and uh, write down what you think your emotions would be and what their emotions might be. Uh, it, like I said, I can't cover it all. This is a wide topic over 16 weeks and we're covering a, a lot of area in a short amount of time and so we're, we're kind of just hitting the highlights. 
So please take out that time as, as, we, as we get ready for next week's lesson to go back over these stories and see if you can find out some more of those emotions. As a matter of fact, I would love it if, if, uh, if every now and then you would just send me an email and say, this is what I, what I thought. And, and let me see that you're, you're really thinking about this and you're, you're dwelling on it and trying to find out what this is. I want you to try to see how you could have handled it differently. Because, uh, like I said, we all think that we can do better than others. So I want you to kind of write down or think about how you would handle it differently. Would you obey God? Would you, would you not have been tempted to look back? Uh, would you be more focused on doing God's will than, than looking back at things that, that may have been pleasurable in your lifetime and uh, draws you back? Uh, how would you handle that? And maybe even try to find scriptures that would back you up on your decision on how you would handle it. You say, why do that? Well, with that way, if you're ever in a situation for yourself or if you're counseling someone, and many of you are taking these courses uh, to be a, a biblical counselor, then you will have the artil uh, artillery to use at your disposal. Listen, if you're going to be a counselor, a biblical counselor, your best thing that you have to stand on, and like I said, your most protection that you have is make sure that you have scriptures to back up your answers and, and your advice and, and the things that you're telling them. If you're talking about your own terms and you ever wind up in the court of law, then uh, then you're going to hope that you've got scripture because God's authority right now, as I said last week, is still upholded in the courts. And so you have a leg to stand on. You can say, it wasn't my idea. This is what God said. And if you have a problem with that, you need to take it up with God. And uh, so therefore, study these emotions and study these situations that we're talking about. See if you can find scriptures that would help them in that situation, that would help you in that situation, that would help someone you're counseling in that situation to be able to make the right decisions and be able to look at it in a point of view that God would have us to look at certain things. And also for the, all those that are going through their graduate degree, please remember that you're still supposed to be reading Happiness is a Choice because in order for you to complete this course, you have needed to read that entire book. So if you're not started on that book, uh, my advice is to get started. Uh, it's, I can't remember, I think it's two or 300 pages long, or maybe 238 pages, I think. Uh, so it, it's quite a, quite a good sized book. It, it can be read pretty quickly if you just sit down and read it, but most of us is uh, filled with classes and, and life and jobs and things that uh, it'd be wise that you go ahead and get on to it. So we're kind of through with the Abraham, Lot, and Sarah, and all those. So like I said, what I want to do next is I want us to look at Job. And as I said at the beginning, I want to spend some time with Job because he went through such a wide range of circumstances and emotions that most people never have to go through. There again, many of the things that he went through are things that we go through on a daily basis too we would understand and can understand the loss of a loved one. But to fully understand uh, about Job's emotions, or at least uh, have to attempt to find out what they might have been, we must first go over the main story of Job. And there we can see where he's at when, uh, when we pick up this subject. Of course, the story is told in the book of Job. So if you have your Bibles, please get it out and turn to the book of Job to the first chapter. I'm going to give you some time to do that uh, while I take a drink. So go ahead and have your Bibles be turning to the book of Job, and we'll start at the first chapter. Okay, if you found Job, like I said, we'll start in the First chapter, and let's go ahead and read a few verses there. Again, I hope this program's working better than it had in the past, uh, because in the past it really left me with a what <laughs> a kind of attitude. So hopefully this is working fast. If not, then we'll take up the time and I'll find a Bible. I meant to have one close by. I'll find a Bible. Maybe it won't be King James, because uh, I do use other Bibles for study Bibles, but we'll uh, find one and look it up. So in Job chapter 1, verse 1, it said, there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. I want you 
if you write in your Bibles, I want you to underline that he was perfect and upright. And underline the rest of this. And one that feared God. But it wasn't only perfect and upright in God's eyes. And, 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 and saying that, let me back this up just a little. We are never perfect enough to be perfect in God's eyes to his standard. Maybe he was perfect according to man's standards, but not to God. But in man's standards, he was perfect and not right. And the Bible says, and one that feared God, so underline that, one that feared God. And the Bible said he eschewed evil. Well, what does that mean, eschewed evil? That meant that he, he tried to stay away from it. It would do us all good to try to stay away from evil. If you flirt with evil, it's going to bite you. It's kind of like a snake. You can sit there and play with it, play with it. Eventually, it's going to bite you. Um, and it says in verse 2, And they were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. So he had a total of ten youngins. Now, I don't know about you, but with me, uh, just with the, the, the two that I had, uh, one of them not even been with me most of the time, uh, that was a challenge. <laughs> so I can't imagine having... Uh, three daughters, which I had two, and 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 seven sons. I'm sure there was all kind of bickering and stuff going on. Maybe them kids back in those days wasn't as bad as ours because ours is so spoiled. But here he had seven sons and three daughters. Now, I'm, and and it says his substance also was seven thousand sheep. Now imagine that he had to have land big enough to, to sustain seven thousand sheep. He had 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses, which is donkeys, and a very great household, which is servants and all that was with him. So that this man was the greatest of all the men in the East. So in his particular area, there was no more had been more blessed than Job. As far as materially, he had it all. As far as with all the kids, he had it all. And so I'm sure that there was people in the community that uh, had a jealousy towards him. Uh, some of them may have a, a greed towards what he had. Uh, maybe some of them were proud of the, of the success that he had. Maybe some of them loved him uh, because of his wealth and was wanting to use him. Uh, I'm sure the people of the city around about uh, looked at him uh, with all kinds of emotions. But when you when you think of uh, Job during this particular time, uh, I guess you could kind of think of some of our wealthy people, like the Rockefellers. Uh, I think I, I think uh, I'm trying to think of the man's name. I think it was Hughes. Hughes. Uh, anyhow, his I believe it was Hughes. They said at at the particular time he was the most wealthiest man in the world. They said that he was so Howard Hughes. They said he was so wealthy that uh, in all reality, he could have bought the whole entire city of Atlanta uh, with money being compared today of what it was then. But money, let me tell you, doesn't buy happiness. Just because uh, Job had all these things, uh, that wouldn't have made him happy. Uh, the money doesn't buy happiness. They asked Howard Hughes, for instance, they said, with all the money that he had, they said, uh, when are you wealthy enough? And you know what his answer was? His answer was the next billion so that lets you see that, that that's not by happy. Another way to prove it, too, that he wasn't happy is because uh, he, he feared to death that someone was going to take his money. And when he wouldn't go out in public much, and when he did, he'd wear a mask. Uh, he would stay secluded in his house. So all that money wasn't doing him any good. A lot of people wished to be him. And like we mentioned before, people that win the lotto, a lot of times people want to be them. But sometimes that lotto brings more pain than it did the pleasure that money could have bought. Bible says that there is pleasure in sin for a season, but the end thereof is death. And so it's not the money. It's because of the fact that Job was a godly man, one that feared God, and one that tried to live his life holy. This is what brought him great joy. It wasn't his money. The money was a residual of him following God like he did. For instance, Solomon, Solomon him being the wisest man, the reason God blessed Solomon so much with material things is because his desire was to have wisdom from God, and obviously Job was a lot. Uh, uh, Job was a lot like uh, him because he wanted to make sure that he was pleasing God. And then it goes on to say, 
and his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and uh, uh, sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned, and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now I want to take a little time on that, and we may repeat some of this. Uh, like I said, re repetition is always good. It's never a harmful thing to repeat yourself. A lot of people don't want to preach the sermon, sometimes the uh, same sermon, but sometimes it's good. Sometimes people forget that sermon. Uh, I know myself, I'll be honest with you, they've been times a preacher has preached the message, and the next Sunday I'm going to tell you what he said. So repetition can be good. But here uh, it appears that uh, Job had some emotions for his children there. You can see he had concern. He had love for them. Uh, he wanted to make sure that they would be okay before God. He didn't want anything bad to happen to them. He was very protective, so uh, he was very cautious, making sure that they they had what they needed and they were doing right. And if they weren't, he wanted to protect them. So he had a sense to give them some sort of protection and a duty to give them some protection. And in that protection, there's also a little bit of fear because you, 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 you don't want anything to happen. There's a little bit of dread in emotion there because you don't want people to suffer. And you're worried that that might take place. And so in order to keep that from happening, Job was taking his time, making sure that he was sacrificing uh, animals for their, and, and making petitions to God uh, for his kids because he loved them so much. That emotion of love was so great in his heart that he thought more about them than he thought about himself. So there's some emotions that he had right there with his kids. And here's where the trouble begins. And it says in verse 13, And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain their servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. I'm sure that alone knocked him to his feet. Evidently, the day was going fine, and then all of a sudden, bad news. And that's not, it's, that, it, that's not where the story ends, though. If it had ended there, it would have been bad enough. But it said, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and it burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And once again, that would Although double, it would still have been enough to have to bear. But then it goes on verse 17, it says, and While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and only am, uh, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So obviously the sheep and those servants and those people were in a different location than this, and now the camels are gone. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another, and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating, drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind in the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are, are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now can you imagine? It was bad enough to see his possessions being destroyed. One right after another. But then to top it all off. The very ones that he loved. The very ones that he cared for. The very ones that he was sacrificing for. The very ones that he dreaded that something might come upon them. Sure enough, what he feared happened. Something happened and they died. Uh, they they didn't die without God. It doesn't say that, but they did die. And so uh, I'm sure that put a lot of stress and emotions and sadness and heartache and uh, uh, questions for God. Uh, and, then it, and, and then it says, and then Job arose. And now, this is why I love the book of Job. We go through our problems, and many times our problems feel big at the time. 
But when we read the book of Job, if we were take it in contact with our problem, our problem will see very little, very small, very minute than what Job was going through. And it said, then Job arose. Now, picture yourself. You Like I said, we're trying to kind of get these emotions, and we'll talk more about these emotions. We'll go back over this in detail again. And like I said, we will repeat some of this. But as we're reading these verses, I want to make sure we're covering this. Because like I said, the book of Job is such an important book when dealing with emotions. And we can get a lot of our counseling ideas from this and a lot of the strength and scriptures that we need through the book of Job. So I want to make sure we're spending time here. But imagine you going through and you've done most all your possessions. You, you served God with all your heart. You served him with your mind, body, and soul. And yet all your possessions are gone and all your family's gone except for your wife. Would you still want to serve God or would you be angry with him? Would you be upset with him? Would you rejoice? What would you do? Uh, so take some time and think about that this week. But let's see what Job did. In verse 20, it says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle. By renting his mantle, and we'll, we'll discuss this again, because it's important, by renting his mantle, it shows that he was grieved. It shows that he was upset. It shows that he was severely in a state of sadness. And it said, and he shaved his head again, a sign of, 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 of being hurt and in pain, and fell down upon the ground again, a sign of sadness, a sign of pain, a sign of grieving, a sign of wonderment, a sign of confusion. Uh, but yet this is what he said after that, after all of that, even with those signs of grief and sadness and, and questioning God, uh, but yet not speaking it, just, just all the sadness and emotions and, and confusion that was going on, it said, and he worshiped. He worshiped after God had taken everything or allowed Satan to take it. God didn't do it. He allowed Satan to take it. Uh, God doesn't do things like that. He allowed Satan to do it. And this is what he said. And, and see, there again, I want you to see if you would be able to say this after all this had taken place, after you had served God with all your heart, mind, and soul, you trained up your kids the right way, you lived a good life, you tried to stay away from evil. Would you say this? And this is what he said in verse 21. He said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And he concludes that by saying in all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. In other words, God didn't, uh, Job didn't blame God. Job had the right kind of aspect. Um, and, I, and I want you to I want to notice a few things here before we go into the emotions that Job experienced. First, I want you to see the meaning of the land that Job lived in. I found this very interesting. Uh, us means the actual meaning of us means counsel, and I think that's fitting uh, for a meaning of what's written here in the book of Job. Job not only receives counsel from his friends, but also from his wife. And finally, he gets counsel from God. And then the next thing I want you to notice is that according to the first couple of verses, that Job does not go through all of this because of sin. Uh, many people, uh, they try to attach sin to people's problems. Uh, but that is not always the case. I would advise us to be careful when we uh, cancel someone and not try to relate every condition on some sort of sin that they may be going through or might have gone through in the past. The old saying uh, says that bad things happen to good people, and that's a very true statement. It is sad, however, that most people, when they see someone going through something, believe that it's because they are sinning or have rebelled against God. And I'm sure that you can recall several instances in your life that where you went through some bad things, that had nothing to do with you doing anything wrong. Uh, we noticed that this uh, concept that our problem or a direct result of sin was even during the disciples' day. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to John chapter 9, verse 1 and, and 2. So let me give you just a few minutes to turn there. I feel like it's important that you do this. Because we need to show how people think, uh, how we do that, and we blame people about sin. 
and, and that it was happening even years and years ago in Christ's day. So if you got over to uh, John chapter 9, John chapter 9, and we'll read verse 1 and verse 2. This is what the Bible says about that. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Now, there again, if we're going to say that it's because of sin, uh, then people would probably say this was. Well, why is he born blind? Obviously, God had, had to deal with him sometime or another. Uh, his mother disciped him saying, asked or him saying, Master, who did sin? This man or his parents? that he was born blind. So they'd already, now these, these guys had been walking with Jesus. These guys had lived a lot. Some of them still, as we see in Peter's life, still had problems in their own life. They had sin in their own life. But yet, because this man's blind, they immediately, even though walking with Jesus, see his love, see his compassion, see his non-judgment attitude, they're saying this man or either his parents must have sinned because this man had been born blind. Surely what he's going through is because of something that's happened within that family. So we see from their statements, most must have viewed during those days that if a person was suffering from something, it must have been because of sin, either in their life or in one of their relatives' lives. However, I'm, I'm grateful for verse 3, uh, because Jesus explains it. He says, however, uh, Jesus shows that there are other reasons for people's problems when he said, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents. So he squashed their little ideas right off the bat. And it's amazing how Jesus knows. He knows the heart, the intents of our heart. We have many people that try to act righteous, but God knows their heart's not. And then we have people that doesn't live the best life, but their heart wants to. David was an example of that one. He didn't always do what was right, but his heart was after God. Uh, but then he explains what it was. It says, but that the works of God should be, man, be made manifested in him. Now by that, this should give you some comfort. That if you're going through something right now, and you feel like that you may have done something that had caused God to pass judgment on you, or to cause whatever you're going through that happened to you, uh, that it may not be because of that. See, we fail to realize that God has a bigger plan and purpose in our lives. Sometimes, as he did here with Job, when he sees that you're spiritually mature enough, he will allow you to go through things so that uh, family and friends can see how we handle it. See, he, what he wants is he wants us to be a light. He wants us to be a good witness and that we're fully trusting in him in everything that we do. That we don't blame God for problems in our life, but instead we pray to him to help us bear it. And so I want you to think about that. I know that Satan a lot of times will use uh, our sinful life condition at times that we live and, and say, oh, it's because of this that this has happened to you now. But sometimes it's not. Now, there again, sometimes it is. I'm not saying that if you sin, that you won't suffer. The Bible said if you sow in the flesh, in the flesh you'll also reap. That what you sow it, you shall reap. So if we do wrong, if we sin, somewhere down the line that sin is going to produce some bad fruit. But just because something bad happens into your life, it doesn't automatically apply that and, and cause that to be the reason. Because sometimes God is using it so that he can use us as that example, as our witness and our testimony to see how we're handling it. It's always good to be able to see people who have gone through things and know that they made it through and the toughest times. That's why, like I said, this is why I'm so glad for the book of Job because uh, when we go through situations in our life, now Job had to go through more than anyone that, that I can ever imagine besides Jesus Christ himself. But that has always been a book that we can go to, especially if you're going to be a counselor to where we can find uh, how we can be able to go through anything in life with Jesus on our side. And we can find that there are times in our life that things just happen. It's, it's part of life. It's part of living in a world uh, where we have sinned against God and sin rules and reigns and, and, and Satan has dominion 
over this earth. He's constantly there to, to accuse the brethren of the sin that they commit, to tell us how unworthy we are before God. He's there to try to trip us up and try to make us fall. So we have all these things that are against us. And so therefore, like I said, I'm so glad for the book of Job so that we can go back here and we can see that everything that happens in our life is not necessarily brought on upon ourselves. It should give us comfort. It should give us strength. It should give us some sort of peace, knowing that God's in control no matter what's going on. And it also, uh, if, it, if we do find out that he's used us as a mature individual to use us in an example to others, we should also have a sense of emotion, of, of rejoicement and happiness and joy, knowing that God is finding favor in our life, knowing that God sees that we have matured in the word of God into such a manner to where that he can allow some bad things to take place in our life, knowing that we will not blame him, but that we understand that we live in a world of sin and that because of that, bad things are going to happen. We will suffer pain. Uh, the television evangelist has kept bringing a lot of this kind of thought that sin is what caused I've heard, uh, especially healers, what they call themselves healers, they'll say, well, you know, sin has brought this in your life and, and because of that, you're, you're, you can't be healed. You won't believe and you won't be healed. And they give this reason or that reason of why you can't be healed. But that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes people are just born with a sickness. Sometimes you're going to get sick. a matter of fact, scientists will even uh, back it up that every now and then we need to get sick. You say, really? We need to get sick? Yes, at times we need to get sick. And what's the reason for that sickness? That reason for that sickness is that sickness begins to produce mucus and different things in our body that begins to expel things that has built up in our body. So sometimes sickness brings a healing to the body. Uh, we also know that there's a certain amount of germs that we need in order to stay healthy. So everything that happens to us, uh, we can try to live perfect we want, but we're not in a perfect environment. And sometimes even germs helps us uh, be stronger. So what we need to realize is, like I said, that we live in a sinful world, but it should make us joyful knowing uh, that even in the midst of Satan trying to do all these things that God would take out the time, and, 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 and what he did here with Job is so unique. And I'm not saying that we should jump up and down and ask God, please, please let these things come to me. But uh, what I think is amazing, he sat there and told Satan on several occasions when you read through the book of John, Job, have you not considered my servant Job, how faithful he is, how, how righteous he is, how, how he serves me no matter what? Uh, it, would, it should make you feel a little bit good knowing that, God, that you have lived such a life that you have trusted God so much that out of all of creation, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that out of all of creation, God is looking down at this one man and when Satan comes to the throne room of God to give him an account of where he's at, that God in the midst of all that's going on out of all of creation, not just this earth, not just our universe, but universes upon universes, all the things that's going on, the praises and worship that's going on in, in heaven and all the things that's happening on earth. And yet, when Satan comes, he remembers Job, a little man in the, in the land of us, and says, hey, check out my servant. Isn't he doing good? So when you find yourself in a bad situation, think about it for a little while. Don't let your emotions get away with you, and don't let Satan... Uh, put guilt upon you, emotion of guilt or, or regret or sadness or anything like that. Pray about it. Ask God, God, is this something that you're trying to teach me? God, is this something that you're trying to uh, teach others through me? And if you find out that he's doing something to teach you or to teach uh, uh, other people through you, then it ought to make you good. It ought to make you happy in a sense uh, of, of peace and rest knowing that God has confidence in you, not necessarily in your own ability because it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the strength, but confidence in you that you're going to trust him to deliver you out of whatever that situation is. So in that kind of emotion, you instead of being upset, instead of being stressed out about it, instead of worrying about it, uh, if it's a situation like Job found himself in, then we need to rejoice. We need to have that sense of uh, happiness, that sense of satisfaction, knowing that we're where we need to be, that sense of safety, uh, a worry and freeness 
that we should have, knowing that God's under control. And even if it means death, death is not the end for us. Uh, death is just a transfer from this life into the glorious life of God to where we no longer will have pain or suffering or any of these emotions that brings us down. Uh, so it really it's a win-win situation for us. Paul pretty much said the same thing. You know, it's good that we're here to help other people and to be able to enjoy life, but it's better when we get to the other side. We just don't see it that way. But it is better once we enter into the kingdom of God. So with all that being said, this is where Job finds himself as the event starts to unfold in this story. Uh, the Bible said that he was a righteous man. God's word plainly says that he was perfect, that he was upright, that he feared God, and that he stayed away from evil. And yet, all these things come down on Job in one day. It would have been bad if it happened every year every other year, or maybe every five years of being so grievous as either one of these were, one at a time, over a period of time, it would have been terrible. I mean, even if it's a year apart, you haven't finished grieving in that first year, according to most uh, tests on the, on the mind. When we go through a big tragedy, sometimes it takes years. For instance, let me, they tell that if you're married and you have a divorce, that's a traumatic experience. Now, nothing compared to what Job has gone through. They say that if you're married and you get a divorce, it, it's, it's the same almost as losing a loved one. That's almost like having a death of a dear friend or a loved one in your family. And they said that if you're married to get over that hurt, to get over that pain, that uh, let's say that if you were married for five years, that it would take you 10 years to be, to be completely over the hurt and pain. They say for every year that you are married, it takes two years to get over it. Now that's just a marriage. So even in a marriage, if it was just one year, it takes two years to get over it. Now you think about this on Job's level. And on each thing that we read that happened one after other after other, no telling how long he had been with these kids. So that alone, if it was just the loss of the kids, that would have took years upon years upon years. Matter of fact, if it was doubled, it would have took 20 years minimum for him to even begin to get over just the loss of his kids. And yet, he had to go through not only the loss of his kids, but loss of every single thing that he owned, and yet he was the wealthiest man at that particular time. So there you can see the kind of pressure, the kind of anguish, the kind of sadness, the kind of emotions that Job had to be feeling at that, especially knowing that he had lived his life pleasing before the Lord. Now, if he had been evil from day one, maybe maybe his, um, his thought pattern would have been, well, I deserved it. Uh, I've done this and I've done that and I deserve this coming upon me. But from what we're reading in the text, uh, he was a blessed man. And uh, not only with his possessions, but also with a large family and with his sons and daughters. And it wasn't anything that he had done because uh, he tried his best uh, not only to, to, to take care of himself and make himself holy before God, but he did his best trying to teach his kids to act that way and even stood in, in a gap for them. And yet all these things happened. So as we start to study in these emotions of Job, I want you to keep all that in mind. This is not something that uh, that Job expected, it come out of the blue, and all in one day. So I want you, like I said, in, in next week, when, when we're getting ready for next week's lesson, and, and like I said with all these lessons, please take out the time to read over Job. Please take out the time to try to, try to put in your mind uh, how you would felt if you were the one that had all these possessions. Uh, put in your mind if you were the one that had 10 lovely children and put in your mind that you had walked a life so pleasingly before God that you had tried to live before God so well that even God himself stood up and took notice and even God himself uh, thought you had done such a good job that he thought you were uh, that you were ready enough to be able to take on Satan his very self attacking you you see, a lot of the times the things that we go through in our life, I hear people say it all the time. 
the devil really been on me this week. The, re the devil really be on me. Can I be honest with you? Satan is not like God. Satan is a entity that can only be at one place at one time. Uh, he can't read your mind. Uh, he can't do half of what we say that he can do. He depends on demons to find out things. He depends on demons to carry out his work. And if Satan is going to come and deal with someone, and I'm not trying to put you down because I feel like I'm in the same situation, you really have got to be an individual that has been working hard for God, that has kept yourself pure, that has got such a heart for God that pretty much your mind is consumed with God and everything in it. Satan, uh, like I said, I'm not trying to put you down, but Satan is not going to spend his time personally to come after someone that's not doing that much for the Lord. And when I say that, not that much, I'm not saying that, that we may not be preaching, we may, may not be teaching, but what I am saying is someone that not has fully developed himself into the Lord, which meaning that almost every given minute he is finding himself talking about the Lord, reading about the Lord, uh, explaining about the Lord, teaching about the Lord. He's consumed in such a way to where the Lord is all that he is. Uh, that's the one that Satan's going to go for. Now, if you're fighting for God and you're doing great works for God and, and people are being saved, trust me, he's taking notice. His demons are going to come along there. They're going to say, hey, you better watch this one. And if you get powerful enough in those things through the Holy Spirit, not through your own work, but if you get power enough through them things, then yes, Satan may personally come and visit you. But uh, I, the only, only places I know that Satan come here, and I could be wrong, I'll try to find that out later on, uh, but I know that he came to Job personally. Job had a personal confrontation with the devil. Job did. So obviously he had to really be doing something for God. And the other person that I know he had a personal confrontation with is he had a personal confrontation with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So that, that being said, you can kind of see uh, who he goes after. It's not just the average person. Uh, people like Peter, <laughs> which I consider myself being a lot like Peter, say, don't have to come to us. Uh, we mess up enough on our own. He knows that. Uh, so he doesn't have to come to us individually. We kind of do his work for him. But here we see that he comes after people like Job, uh, whose heart and mind was for God, and Jesus Christ, of course, being the Son of God, and whose heart was to please God, and was doing great impacts on the city, uh, or, or on this uh, this world. Uh, he comes after those individuals. Those are the ones that he's after. So uh, that being said, then, then we need to read, while we're reading Job, we need to understand that he's going through a lot greater than what any of us may have ever gone through. Because we've just been fighting with so so called his minions, the demons, the demons of, of the devil, not the devil himself. So Job's heartache, Job's pain, surely would have had to been terrible, uh, more than we can. But like I said, I want you to take out the time. I want you to read the story. I want you to refresh yourself with everything that's in there. I want you to, one of the things we're not going to discuss too much is we're not going to discuss and, and let this be part of your homework also for next week. We're not going to discuss what each one of his so-called comforters uh, said to him and uh, what kind of emotions that they may have felt toward Job. Were they envious of Job? Were they jealous of Job? Uh, did they despise Job? Did they look upon Job as being an evil man? What were some of their emotions? Uh, read their stories, because like I said, we won't cover that in detail uh, in this particular lesson or the next when we deal with Job, we're going to move from that. There's so much to cover here. But while you're reading that, and also I want you to think about how Job may have felt with himself when he's hearing the things that they're saying. Did he question himself? Uh, did he have wonderment thinking, well, maybe they're right? Did he begin to have self-doubt? Uh, did he begin to have almost a state of depression or, or lose hope? What were some of the emotions that Job may have been going through while his so-called comforters, uh, which we're doing as far as I'm concerned, exactly the opposite, uh, how some of that came about. Now, we will discuss more about what God said and told Job when uh, Job finally uh, got in such a depressed state. And maybe we'll also go in and, and, and talk a little bit about depression. Depression is a big thing, and that's why I want to spend some time with Job. There's so many ranges of emotions that he went through. 
But depression is a big thing. And especially when we're doing counseling, uh, we may find a lot of people coming to us wanting to commit suicide. And so therefore, there's some certain things that we need to be looking at as far as emotion-wise and things they're going through that might lead them into a state of depression. Uh, and therefore, we need to be cautious about that. And we're going to see a certain amount of depression here in Job's life. So for next week, that's what I want you to do. I want you to take the different comforters that Job had. First of all, go back at the beginning and try to put yourself in this position of where we find him at so far. But we will be discussing that a little bit more in detail and see if you agree. If you've got other ideas, please email me to them. I would love to hear some of those ideas uh, because it's good to hear from others. Uh, one man's opinion isn't at all. So if you have the time, then, then give me some of those. I would love it. Uh, but but uh, like I said, I want you to focus more so uh, also on, after you get through that, I want you to focus on uh, his comforters and how they may have felt towards him, their emotions, how he must have had emotions towards what they were saying and even maybe some of the things he wanted to say back that could have brought emotions about. So for, for today, we'll go ahead and end it there before we get into the details about Job and his emotions. Like I said, we'll spend another probably whole lesson on Job and cover that. And if we have any time left, we'll go ahead and discuss about some of the uh, depressions and signs of depression, what brings some of that on. We may stay with that for a little while. We may cover that a little bit later as we go on. We'll pull some of that out from the book, uh, That Happiness is a Choice. We'll get some of that through that. So uh, I hope this lesson has been a blessing to you. And like I said, please, as you go through this, be studying and thinking about emotions in every story that you read in the Bible. Try to find out the emotion. Try to get into their lives, their minds, their thoughts, what, what they must have felt. Did they blame themselves? <coughs> Was there guilt involved? Was there rejoicing involved because they knew that they stood right before God? What was it? So this is going to be a good study, I believe, in Job, uh, studying his lifestyle. Uh, and like I said, I don't know who all will get. They will be a mid-term uh, assignment. I can tell you up front, we're going to pick about three people out of the Bible. And I want you to write, uh, I want you to read their stories. And I want you to see the people involved in their lives and themselves. And I'm going to have you to write at least a page on each one. Uh, if not a couple of pages on each one uh, about what kind of emotion maybe they were experiencing and the people that they were involved in and around at that particular time. So just be ready for that because we'll do that on the eighth week. Like I said, this is a 16-week course, so that would be a midterm, sort of like an exam. Uh, so that's, that's why it's a little bit uh, long. I'm not like a lot of other teachers. Some teachers want to give you an assignment that's long every single week. I don't do that. I give you little things to do. So this is kind of making up for some of that. Uh, so be prepared for that. But in, until that time, uh, like I said, I want you to go ahead and read the story of Job. Go through the whole book and try to dig out some of the emotions there. And so we've got about two minutes left. And uh, I always like to end with the word of prayer. Thank you again for being a part of this class. I hope that this semester, uh, this course will give you benefits in your counseling. Pray that God will bless you in your ministry regardless of what you're going to be doing. And uh, so we'll go ahead and we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed and be ready for next week. Lord Jesus, once again, I want to come to your throne and thank you for who you are, and what you are, what you mean to us. And God, I, I love the fact that uh, you gave us the book of Job. I feel sorry that Job had to go through the things that he went through. I can't imagine the suffering and pain that he felt with his kids being gone with all his possessions being gone, we see later that even his wife is not there to give him the right kind of comfort, the right kind of encouragement. We see his friends are there to accuse more than comfort. So God, I thank you, though, that you allowed him to go through that so that we can see the different types of things that we might experience and that we're not alone. And God, we also see in the end that even when he began to complain some, uh, it was a rightful complaint, but yet, in your mind, uh, you told him uh, in a certain way of why he had to go through these things and gave him comfort on that, I'm sure. And so, God, I just thank you that we have not only the book of Job, but we have the power of prayer to where we can come before the throne of grace and that we can ask you for strength to carry us through. Job didn't have the whole Bible like we had, and yet we have the whole Bible that we can depend on. So, God, I thank you for these stories. I thank you for these emotions that we're pulling out. I thank you to see that we're not alone 
And I thank you most of all that these are, there are verses in that Bible that will help us overcome when we're at our weakest hour. And so, God, we just want to give you all the glory and all the praise for all that you do in our lives. And give us the strength to continue on and to help lead others to know you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. See you next week.